Praise the Lord. So we just uh, um, if you're just tuning in on uh, public access television or on Facebook or on our website or YouTube, uh, we had a, a wonderful time of sharing a testimony that Pastor Sharon and I did, so please make sure that you look at it. Um, this is a message, this is a Grace Notes. <clears throat> if you're just tuning in to our ministry for the first time, Grace Notes is something uh, that we share that God uh, either gives Pastor Sharon or myself as a kind of an inspirational, devotional type of thing and expounding of the Word of God to uplift, uh, although everything that we preach is uplifting, but those things tend to be uh, non, not following a particular theme that we have, like we've been doing Discovering the Heart of Prayer um, as we approach the end of the year. But this I felt, this was a word that the Lord gave me a, a while ago, a few weeks ago, um, and we were supposed to preach it on Friday night, but the place where we gather it had plumbing <laughs> situations, which actually turned for good if you check out that testimony. So my message for today is no good thing. No good thing. And we're going to, it's a devotional uh, from uh, Psalms 8411. So, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Mm -hmm. That's what that verse is. But particularly, I want to focus, we're going to talk about that verse. No good thing does he withhold to them who walk uprightly. Because the thing that we need to be careful of as Christians is that the enemy uses the word of God to enslave us. To put us into bondage. To make God feel like he's so far away. You need to be careful, especially if you're tuning in for the first time to our ministry and you haven't really followed us. We, we, we preach from the Old Testament, but you have to preach from the Old Testament through the lens of the cross. Matter of fact, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have to be understood in, through the lens of the cross. That... Everything Jesus said when he was on earth, he said before he died. Then when he rose from the dead, those are the things that you need to focus in on and, and look at in terms of what Jesus said, what his comments were after he rose from the dead, as opposed to, you know, him before, right? So wanna, we're going to take a look at that. And let's look at what does uprightly mean in the Hebrew? It comes from, from to complete, entire, and it's usually literally or figuratively or morally, and also as a noun, integrity and truth. That's the whole context of that word uprightly, those who walk uprightly. And we need to understand what does uprightly mean? We need to define what that means, because if he withholds no good thing from people who walk uprightly, we want to walk uprightly, right? Okay. So let's look at that. That word, complete, is having all the necessary parts, elements, or steps. It also means brought to an end, highly proficient, right? So part of that is from the root word of uprightly is from to be to complete, right? That is at the root of walking uprightly. So what does completeness mean? Remember we've talked about there's uh, when sons of gods, there's different words for, for sons. There's nepios, there's tech, nepios is a baby. Uh, technon is like a toddler. And a huios is a fully mature son of God, right? A fully mature sons. We talked about how only mature children, like you wouldn't give your eight-year-old the keys to the car, right? You put them in the booster seat, they sit in the back seat in a protective thing and they get buckled in, they get driven. Adult children are given the keys to the car. Your father wants to give you the keys to the kingdom, but you have to be mature to handle what your father wants. So that no good thing does he withhold for them who, are, who walk in completeness. Jesus finished the work on the cross. So you need, we need to ask ourselves, to what degree am I walking in the completed, finished work of the cross? That is at the root of walking uprightly, right? So that word entire is having no element or part left out. So in other words, let me take a step back. The, the completeness is how well do you handle the word of God, right? The scriptures talks about being able to handle the word of God, rightfully dividing the word of truth, being able to discern the things, right? If you're reading an Old Testament passage that talks about, you know, God killing people, 
and then you start to become afraid that, oh, you know, well, what if God's going to punish me? Then you're not walking in the finished work of the cross. Right? Because God says, never again will I be angry with you. Your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. The blood of Jesus is total and complete. All of your sins, past, present, and future, I've been completely wiped away. Why? Because the cross exists outside of time. Right? So when I, I get it, when I'm reading the Old Testament, and I see something there that contradicts the truth of what Christ did for me on the cross, God never contradicts himself. So then discernment is required to be able to rightfully divide the word of truth. You know, I remember many years ago, uh, I told someone, you know, we were talking about the scriptures, and they were saying to me, you know, like, wow, you know, like when I read the Bible, like the Old Testament or something like that, like it's heavy. You know, I find it like, like, you know, wow, like I can't please God. And then they said to me, well, how do you see, how do you read the Bible? And this, this person was a Christian. And I said to him, I read it like a love letter. And they looked at me like, well, how do you get love out of like Genesis 6, you know, and, and you know, the Tower of Babel and all this other stuff? I said, you have to understand that when you read the word in its context, in every aspect, even in the Old Testament, when God was, you know, here and man was there, where there was a veil that separated man from God, and only the high priest was allowed to enter in, you still see the mercy of God. You still see a heart of compassion. And it was before the cross. Now imagine now after the cross. God wanted nothing more than to grab you, hold you, squeeze you, bounce you on his leg. That's why he sent his son to die for you on the cross. Because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to do that. Because of our sins. Right? So when we walk in that that completeness, that entirety, no elements are missing. We're not saying that we're not going to fall and we're not going to trip up and make mistakes, right? Because we're still in the flesh until Jesus comes to bring us to the Father, right? But when you understand how much you love and the fullness and the completion of the cross, then you don't have to worry about anything, right? Though a righteous man falls seven times, I quote this a lot, he gets back up again. Why does he get back up again? Because he knows he's righteous. When you know the cross settled it between you and God for all time, and you stumble and you fall, you're going to get back up again. You're not going to stay on the floor, right? So, it talk about integrity and truth. Now, there's three definitions of integrity. Firm adherence to a code of especially moral, of especially of moral value, incorruptibility. So, that first thing is adherence to a code, right? So, excuse me. <clears throat> Here's our code. Right? If you understand the word of God from Genesis to Revelation in the context of that cross, it'll free you. Mm. It'll give you power over the evil one. You won't be hoodwinked. <clears throat> you won't be scooped up. You won't be led astray. You won't be condemned. Because there's things in here that if they're not preached in context, you will get condemned. Right? Like, for example, one of my favorite ones that I like to quote because it's been misquoted. And we have been given the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. Right? New Testament, spirit of adoption. <clears throat> we are not adopted. If we were, we'd still have the nature of the devil. That word was misinterpreted by the, by the folks who originally wrote the King James Bible. Because the word in the Greek means placement as sons. And so, <clears throat> if I'm placed as a son, I would interpret that, well, I guess that means adoption. No. You know how you know you're not adopted? Because Jesus said, you must be born again in John, John 3. And Nicodemus said, well, how can a man go back into his mother's womb? And Jesus says, lest you be born of water and spirit, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You are born of water and spirit. You are a child of God. Your spirit has been reborn. You still have the same old body you had before you got saved. But your spirit is in the image of God himself. And your physical body is not the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And for those, if, if you have an understanding of the Old Testament, from Exodus forward, when the law came into effect, God does not inhabit dirty places. God does not inhabit unsanctified places. The punishment for touching the ark 
was death unless you were called and appointed to carry it. No one can enter into the holy place except the priest. After washing their hands and their feet, if they defiled it, the Lord would put them to death, would kill them. If the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year to sprinkle the blood of the, of the lamb before the ark, on the, on the mercy seat of the ark, for the whole nation would cover their sins for an entire year, and the blood of an animal, imagine the blood of your Savior, and how powerful and efficacious that is. If he walked in, they tied a rope on his foot, because if he went, be, and they had little bells, so when he walked, he made tingling noises. If he walked in there and they didn't hear any bells, that means he died and they pulled him out. And the, the nation, the whole nation of Israel can expect nothing but famine and sword and punishment until the next year. It's a serious business. God is a holy God. Right? But for you and I, there's no fear. Because guess what? We are holy too. We're made in his image. Our spirit, man, is his. Our bodies are now his temple. That means we have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. You may do unsanctified behavior, but you will never be unsanctified because nothing is more powerful than the blood of Jesus. So I just want to say that to you because that is that sense of, of, of being in uh, adherence to a code. So you know what? You can walk out your life and you can, you can let the Holy Spirit work in you, work for you, work in you, through you, through this word, an understanding of this word, right? Why? Because you're sanctified and you're holy. You're not trying to be holy. You are already holy. You see, you, when we pray, we don't pray trying to get victory. We pray from victory, the victory that was won for us on that cross and when Jesus rose from the dead. Right? So that sense of integrity is us walking out the truth that has been spoken out. That's it. However little you know, however much you've received, walk in that truth. Because the more you walk in that truth, and the more you stand in that truth, the stronger your faith will be, and faith is trusting God, and the more you'll grow in other areas. The things that you don't like about yourselves, the things that we don't like about ourselves, surrender them to the Lord. Don't beat yourself up. Because all that stuff is already taken on the cross. God is a surgeon. He goes in at the root of our problems. He works from the inside out. We want from the outside first in. I want the job, Lord. But you see, if he gives you that job, perhaps, it might lead you a wrong way. So he has to prepare our integrity, our moral compass to be able to go into that place and be able to excel and be victorious and be a good witness to him. Uh, integrity is also an unimpaired condition, soundness, right? We have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Why do we need a sound mind? Because we're going to get bombarded with a bunch of nonsense. We're going to get bombarded with all kinds of crazy thoughts. And the soundness of mind comes from knowing him and what he did for you on that cross. Right? You know, the enemy throws all kinds of crazy things. Lustful thoughts, this thought, that thought. People think, well, lust is sexual. No. If you desire something strongly, like um, a Snickers bar, <laughs> I, I'm, try, I'm trying to be funny, but any, any, when you look at that word, lust, it's an, it's an inordinate desire for something. Mm -hmm. and it's usually something that's not either healthy for you or good for you or whatever. Hey, that was already taken on the cross. You don't have to beat yourself up over that. Just look to him, looking unto Jesus, right? right. Mm -hmm. The author and perfecter of our faith. Every time we get into these situations, we need to look away from our problems and look right. to him. That's how we can gain victory. So that is that soundness of mind. That soundness of mind is, you know, I got this bill and, you know, I don't have the money to pay for it. I'm going to have to pay it late. Pay it late. Don't beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. We are all going to go through difficulties. In this life, you will have tribulations and trials, Jesus says. But be of good cheer. That's a choice. Mm -hmm. You can choose to be a sourpuss, or you can choose to be joyful. Because he said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Whatever's coming your way is not a surprise to God. So you pay the bill late, big deal. Oh, but you know, my credit's standing. Listen, 
Your standing as heaven is worth a lot more than your credit standing. I'd rather have good standing in heaven because we all have good standing with heaven. We are all God's children. God loves us. And we may live like the devil, but at the end of the day, when that trumpet blast goes off, we're all going to go up. But we're not all going to receive the same rewards. Reward is based on faithfulness and integrity and you standing up when the enemy comes at you. You want to be used of the Lord? You have to embrace those moments of inconvenience and allow God to use you to touch others and for you to be transformed in, this, in that time. The, other, the last thing is the quality or state of being complete or undivided. <clears throat> when you know the Word of God and you walk in that Word of God and in the truth of what Jesus did for you on the cross, you're undivided, right? No matter what gets thrown your way, you're going to stand. Remember the armor of God? Stand ye therefore, right? Your loins girt with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Mm -hmm. Peace. God is not angry with you. There is nothing more powerful in all of your life than to remind yourself that God is no longer angry with you because of the cross. No matter what situation you're in, no matter what you've done, it's all been paid for on the cross. That will empower you to get up and allow God to do a new thing, which is the theme for our church for the coming year. A new thing. A new thing in your life. A new revelation of his character, a new revelation of himself. God wants to show you more of himself, but you have to be willing. You have to position yourself and put yourself in a place that allows God to show and reveal more of himself to you. Right. Now, that word truth, we know truth is Jesus. Jesus is truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And in the Greek, that word is aletheia, which is truth. He is truth. And I got to tell you, walking in truth is a very simple thing. Walking in truth is walking in discipleship. It's following Jesus. He leads, we follow. No good thing. That word good is such a beautiful word. It encompasses so much. So much in its broadest sense. Everything is good. No good thing does he withhold. Mm -hmm. That word withhold is restrain. It means to, to, to stop you, to go no. To close the door for you. He would never do that. No good thing will he restrain you from having if you walk uprightly. And walking uprightly is a beautiful thing. It's just following Jesus. You don't have to be perfect. All you have to know is that you're loved perfectly. Perfect love casteth out all fear, for fear brings torment. He who fears has not been perfected in love. Love is a beautiful, powerful thing that perfects us. It cleanses us. When you know how much you're loved, it cleanses your mind, your thoughts. You know, if there's things, if you're watching this, and, and, and you say, you know, Pastor, I've been, I've been struggling with this habit. I, I can't see, you know, whether it's I can't quit smoking or I can't stop doing this. I promise you, if you think and focus on how much you're loved, that love will drive that addiction right out of your life. Mm -hmm. What drives us to do a, a, addictive things? Because people think addiction, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever. Listen, sometimes just doing the same thing over and over again. Stuffing our mouths with, you know, chocolate or whatever to the point where we get overweight. It, it's, it's, it's an, it, we can't stop ourselves. We want to try to feel good. Listen, if you knowing that Jesus Christ died a horrible death for you on that cross, took all your sicknesses, all your diseases, and all your infirmities, if that's not enough to lift your spirits, that's, he's better than a Hershey bar. Trust me. He is. When you know how much you're loved, it's, it's an amazing thing. And let me tell you this. You know, you, you, maybe you're watching this and you're like, well, you know, Pastor, I just have a hard time that God would love someone like me. I hear you and I've been there. But let me just tell you this. If someone took their child, their only child, and gave them up so that someone else would live, would you say that is an incredible act of love? Most of us wouldn't do that. I don't know you. Especially if they were a criminal, right? Who would give up their child to die for a criminal? Mm -hmm. I think that person, if they did that, would probably put in a mental institution because for us, that's crazy. That's what God did. Mm -hmm. God took his only begotten son 
and laid him up as a sacrifice for you and I. And maybe you're watching this and say, well, you know, I wasn't a criminal pastor and I, I didn't do this and, you know, I wasn't a murderer or th whatever. Okay. But have you worried? <clears throat> have you, do you get angry? Have you said unkind things to people? Mm -hmm. Because according to the word of the Lord, Jesus Christ himself established the standard that if you call your brother a fool, it's like committing murder. You telling somebody they're stupid or that they're a liar or whatever. Even if what they said wasn't true, it's already been paid for on that cross. There is not a sin of man, whether you're saved or not, that Jesus did not take on that cross. When it says he took the sins of the world, he took the sins of the world. It wasn't just our sins. It was every, your neighbor, your, your unsaved boss. All of their sins were taken on that cross. Why? Because God needs, when, when the time comes, he's going to take ownership of this world back in completeness. No one will be, no one will have an excuse when they stand before the white throne of God. They will have been given every single opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. God's sovereignty and God's love is exemplified that he sent his son to die for people who will never accept him as Lord and Savior. Knowing, see God knows perfectly. He knows everything. And yet knowing that, okay, that person will never accept my son, yet my son's blood will pay for their crimes. Think about that. So then think about how much you're loved. God gave his only begotten son on that cross to die a horrible death for you and I. So whatever we're going through right now, we're just going through it. We're not going to live there. It's not going to last forever. It's for a season. Don't give up. I feel that in my spirit that the Lord wants to tell you, don't give up. Embrace the place where you are right now. Say, Lord, I may not like what I'm going through. I may not enjoy what I'm going through. But nevertheless, at your word, I will accept it. Lord, I will embrace this place where I'm at. That you may work out in me what you have put in me. Which is Jesus. And I, just in closing, I want to give you a context of the verse. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord would give grace and glory. Mm -hmm. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Mm -hmm. The Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And that word withhold, like I said, is to exclude or prohibit someone. God wants to give you more than you can possibly imagine. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Very simple. Ephesians 3. He who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. Mm -hmm. To the degree that you allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life That's right. in meekness and gentleness and you start acting and speaking like Jesus, He will withhold no good thing from you. Mm -hmm. That's right. He loves every single one of us, but it delights the Father's heart when we are obedient. Yes. Old Testament, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. God is not looking for sacrifices from us. God is not looking for us to break dance and, and give all this money. All he wants is obedience. Right. Yielding to him because of the cross. That's the, only, that's the only thing. And if you're walking in love, you're walking in obedience. Because love bears all things, believes all things, endures all things, hopes all things. Love never fails. Right. Where there's tongues, they'll cease, and prophecies will cease, and miracles will cease. But love is the one thing that will endure throughout all of eternity. Mm -hmm. And that is the greatest demonstration of the love of God mm -hmm. for us. And that word blessed, blessed is the man. It means to be straight, especially to be level. Blessed is the man. You know, when we walk in that truth, and we walk in uprightness, and we walk a surrendered and yielded life to the Lord Jesus Christ, we, our lives will be straight. Our paths will be straight. Mm -hmm. He will give his angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, lest we dash our foot against a stone. See, we like to quote that. We love quoting these verses. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91.1. But we don't want to yield. Mm -hmm. We don't want to surrender. Mm -hmm. We just want God to give us our toys. You know, even something as healing that was provided for us on that cross will be hampered by our disobedience. I don't mean sin. Sin's been dealt with on the cross. I mean disobedience. 
not yielding to the Lord, opening the door to the enemy. Because every time we don't follow God, we're following the enemy. And if we're doing our own thing, then we're, we become God. We become God. And that word, who trusts in you, means to hide, to go quickly for refuge. You know what? Many of us, when we find ourselves in trouble, the first place we run to is our credit cards. <laughs> Instead of running to him. Now, I'm not saying don't use your credit cards. But I can tell you that Pastor Sharon and I have been in situations where we didn't have any more credit cards because of reasons I won't get into now. All we had was the cost. And we went to him and we cried out and he has sustained us, he has kept us, he has provided for us. No good thing. No good thing. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I'm telling you there is nothing more that blesses the heart of God than when we are obedient children. You know what? We had a choice to make. She could have said, you know what? The day's getting late. We have service tonight. I'm not going to talk to this woman. Or I was like, you know what? Just get finish. Finish your plumbing and get out of my house. <laughs> That's usually what we do. But when we see these inconveniences yeah, as, right. as coming yeah. from our inconvenient God, because we all want to get used. Oh, Lord, I want to be used in ministry. Right. I want more from my life. And then all of a sudden, your car breaks down. The plumbing goes wrong. There's an electrical problem. And what's your attitude? They left my mess. Look at that mess they left. Look at this thing. Now I got a vacuum. I got to clean up. Look at this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. You missed the point. Amen. But if your attitude is, Lord, I thank you. And I made myself available to speak. Because I'm telling you, if you make yourself yes. available, God will use you. Yes, amen. That's right. And then if there's a mess left, listen, you're talking to a person who was up to 1 o'clock at night. And then I had to get up the next day and spend several hours cleaning the sanctuary, mopping, getting rid of all the sewage and all this other stuff. And you know what? I did it with joy because I knew in my heart, Lord, I yielded to you. I lost sleep and God made it up for me. Mm -hmm. I got that reward. I got that diamond for talking to that brother and lifting that brother's spirit up. That's what we're here for. We're not here to get. We're here to give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love gives. Mm -hmm. Love doesn't seek its own. It doesn't seek its own way. It doesn't want to get its will. It, it always looks, love is a servant's heart. Yes, amen. Love says, I will vacuum, I will clean up, I will mop. And they'll do it joyfully with a song. Love will get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go, take, go to somebody's house that needs help. Love will just say, oh, you know, I'm going through some difficulties. Oh, we'll pray for you. No, what do you need? Food? Here, I'll share with you what I have. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of money, but here. You know when you do that? Because you know he gave everything for you. He withheld not a single thing from you when he hung on that cross. Why would you withhold that from someone else? Some people that we have in our lives, they annoy us, and they're usually family members. And most of them are Christians. Annoy you to no end where you want to strangle them and kill them and commit murder. And be like, well, you know, that's, this has been forgiven on the cross. And I may do some time, but... Listen, those are your opportunities and my opportunities to allow what is already inside of us to come forth. Mm -hmm. <sighs> come on. Jesus told that woman caught in adultery, does anyone condemn you? No, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. But he hadn't died yet. So you can't tell people, stop annoying me, go and sin no more. I forgive you, but don't annoy me again. No, because Peter said to the Lord, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? 77 times 7. That means every single time. Forgiveness is not something you feel. It's a right. commandment. Right. We have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. God is no longer angry with us. We have no business being angry with our brother or sister. If you have nothing kind to say to somebody, shut your mouth. <laughs> and say nothing. Mm -hmm. I made it a purpose early on in our marriage that if I could not say something to uplift this woman, I would keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And I have seen the fruit of it. As she has blossomed in, in her, into her own, she does not exist in my shadow. She is my co-lead running this ministry. She preaches. She is confident. Why? Because I gave her the grounds to flourish. Mm -hmm. And 
if she had taken the attitude like you always do, because you know I was a messy, you know I was single, and then I got married, and all of a sudden I'm a, I make a mess all the time. If she took the attitude of like you always do this and you always do that and you always do this, you want me to tell you something? We wouldn't be pastoring right now, because God could not have done what He did in my life if she had not created the ground in our marriage for God to work in me. See, every time I acted ignorant, she'd go in her in the in her bedroom and say, "You deal with your son." And oh boy, did Daddy have some pretty strong conversations with his little boy, and then I would come and apologize to her. And and I I don't know why I'm saying that, but for for particularly in a marriage, the dynamics are that is the perfect opportunity for you to live a sacrificial life. Yeah. What does that mean? That means that if you're used to going into the bathroom to brush your teeth and do your stuff at six o'clock, and your husband beats you in there, and then you get upset, don't, <laughs> don't. It's a test. Everything in life is a test. Somebody yeah, cutting you sure. off while you're driving is a test. Somebody hitting you with a car. I remember one time Pastor Sharon and I went shopping and some old lady hit me with the cut in my ankles. Right. And boy, did I turn around. I must have looked like the devil himself because this woman <laughs> like shrunk like a prune in front of me. And in that moment, we, we were pastors, okay? Don't think the pastor's perfect. And I was like, you know what? And she, she looked at me, she was like, I'm so sorry. I said, no, no, ma'am, it's okay. It's all right. I, I should have paid. I should have moved over. No, no, but I'm really sorry. Are you okay? I, I had a choice. I could have stayed with the look of the devil, right? And then they come and they go to the website and they, oh, that's the guy that I hit in the back that wanted to take my head off. <laughs> Listen, you're always being watched. I don't care what anybody tells you. That's you're always truth. being watched. Yes, amen. We went to a church once where we the, the pastor was up there and whatever, what have you. And then not too long after that, we went to a McDonald's and saw him and his wife. And oh my God, had I not seen them on Sunday, I would have never known this guy was a pastor. Mm. He had a face like, with attitude. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and you know what? I told the Lord, I said, you see, this is why I didn't want to be a pastor, because I know myself. And you know what he said to me? That's fine, you know yourself, but I know you better. And I gave up my life for you. And if you let me, if you let me, if you're willing, I will make you like me. Amen. And I said, here I am, Lord. I am the most unqualified person I can think of on this planet. But I will embrace this calling mm -hmm. because I want to be obedient of everything else. I was a soldier. I know what it means to follow orders. Mm -hmm. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. No good thing he withholds from you. If you sit there and like we used to say in the army and you suck it up and you drive on and you stop complaining mm. and you look up, that's how we're transformed by beholding. Mm. Then the Holy Spirit goes to work. You cannot even begin to imagine what God will do for you. Mm -hmm. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think according to the power mm -hmm. that is at work in you. Is the Holy Spirit asleep inside of you or is he wide awake and active? You're going to have difficult situations. You're going to have things that are going to test your faith because faith is like a muscle. If you don't exercise, it's going to atrophy. Right. You know how I know God? I can trust God? Because of all the difficulties that we've been through for 27 years of our marriage and all the years prior to that before we got married. That's how I know God is faithful. But I need to remind myself because I have my moments where I, the fear wants to come in and I have to say no. Out loud, no. I know. Remember, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. And I'll say, Lord, I'm in this situation. And I know that things look pretty stark and they look pretty damn. But I look to you, Lord. I look to you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of my trust in you. Because you know what? When I refuse to go deeper, I linger in the shadows. Mm. In the shallows of water. God wants to take you deeper into him. Deeper into an awareness of who he is. He wants to show you things that you can't even possibly process in your mind right now. But this is where you're lingering. Mm -hmm. In the water. I can't swim. Even better. Drown in his love. Stop waiting to try to understand and figure things out and, and try to be like, okay, when I have the boldness. Mm -hmm. God calls the unqualified. Yes. Mm -hmm. Paul told Timothy, 
Therefore, my son Timothy, be strong in the grace that is within you. <clears throat> Endure all hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When you call to the ministry, you call to be a soldier. Lay people are not called soldiers. The soldiers, everybody say, I'm a soldier of Jesus Christ. I hate to say it. The people in leadership are called to a higher standard of living. Therefore, my son Timothy, endure all hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What things, soever things you've heard of me or seen in me, commit thou unto faithful men who shall be able to teach also. God puts a premium on faithfulness, and then he gives you the ability. Right. He qualifies the unqualified. Yes, amen. He does not look. Paul said, there's not many renowned among you, not many rich among you, not many famous among you. No, we're nobodies who become somebodies because of him on that cross. That's the thing. If you feel unqualified, God will make you, then now you're qualified. But if you think, well, you know, I have the ability to preach and I have the ability to sing, you're unqualified by his standards. Mm -hmm. He don't want people with PhDs who know everything. He wants people who know nothing other than they know that they're loved and can't keep their mouth shut. The woman at the well became an evangelist like that. But this is where people linger in the, sh in the shallows of the waters. And God is saying, whosoever will come. That has been God's invitation from the very beginning. Adam, where are you? The calling out to us. Whosoever will come. Whosoever will come. Come unto me, are you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Right. If you linger in the shallows, your faith will go nowhere. You're going to go through some deep waters. You're going to go through trials and tribulations and storms. You will, especially if you're called into the ministry. And if you're not in ministry right now and you're like, Pastor, I've been through so many things. It seems like I go from one storm to the next. Hello. Pastor Sharon and I were there. And look where we are now. We still are going through storms. In this life, you will have tribulations and trials. But our challenge is to be of good cheer because of what he did for us in that cross. If I know God is my friend, and I know God sees me as an equal according to the word of what grace and mercy means in the Hebrew, one of the meanings is he sees us as equals, then what do I have to worry about? We have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, my neighbor doesn't like me. My boss doesn't like me. What do you care? God loves you. He doesn't just like you. He loves you. Let him work it out. Let him work it out. Give it to him. Cast the whole of your cares upon him, for he careth for you. That thing is not there to fill space. Maybe the problems that we have is we are unwilling to let go of our troubles. We are unwilling to let go of our difficulties. We are unwilling to let go of our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, whatever it is. Give it to him. Mm. Moses' staff became the rod of God when he laid it down. And then it turned into a serpent. And God said, grab it. He's like, I'm not grabbing that. I mean, listen, I, if it was me, I'd be like, what? You asking me to do what? But you know what? Had Moses not picked up that staff, two million people would have stayed in slavery. Mm. And that staff would not have been the rod of God. But he picked it up and grabbed it. And it was no longer Moses' staff anymore. What are you holding on to right now that God is telling you to let go? Is it a family member? Is it a spouse? Is it a child? Is it your job? Is it your dreams? You know, Pastor Sharon and I have had dreams that were stillborn that never came to pass. And we had a decision to make in that moment. We either let go and let God, or we stay wounded and offended. And I don't believe that had we done that, we'd be pastoring right now. So believe me, you don't, we're, you, you're listening to people who've been there, who have put that God who hung on that cross and took our form and rose from the dead three days later. We have put him to the test and we have found him to be faithful and true and loving. I'm telling you, he will not let you go. He will not let you go. His love is all that matters. His love, his voice is the only one that matters. His love, he's calling us, telling us that he loves us. And he whispers to our ear in those moments when we're quiet and still. Are you quiet and still? There are people who just can't be still. 
And when they're still, they fall asleep. <laughs> Why? Because they're exhausted. They work themselves to the bone trying to please a God who is already pleased with them. God loves you just the way you are. And he has so much more that he wants to do in your life. Amen. If you let him. Mm. Will you let him? Will you let him? Will you take your cares and you drop them? Because no good thing will he withhold from you if you walk in the manner befitting a child of God. Mm -hmm. If you walk in a manner that is a surrendered life. It's not perfection that we're talking about here. God does the perfecting in us as we do the yielding. Mm -hmm. Amen. But yielding is a choice. Like Pastor Sharon said, our choices write our chapters. And our chapters define our future. Mm -hmm. Will you let God turn a new page for you today and write you a new chapter? Mm -hmm. Because God says, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. God wants to do a new thing in your life. Amen. To take you to places and heights that you never even dreamed of. When all that you love in your life is Jesus, your life should be a reflection of it. If you say you love the Lord, you should be walking in love. You shouldn't have a bad attitude. You shouldn't be talking about things. You shouldn't get angry. And if you do, bounce back and say, Lord, I give this to you. I give this bad attitude to you. I give this to you. I surrender that to you. And I just receive and accept your love because I know you love me, Lord. And you'll see me through. Mm -hmm. Next time you sit down to pay your bills, don't worry. Cast the whole of your cares upon him. Amen. Because he cares for you. We have seen money all of a sudden show up. Right in our bank account. As we're doing calculations, we're like, wow, I didn't think the money was going to go to pay all this stuff. And somehow it did. He will do things. He will give you wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, whatever you need. No good thing. No good thing will he withhold from you. No good thing. Amen. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We know that no good thing will you withhold from us who walk uprightly. Lord, we want to walk uprightly. We want to walk as obedient children to you. We want to live a surrendered life, a life that is yielded to you, a life <clears throat> that is meek and gentle, just like our master, Jesus. Yes. Father, we surrender ourselves to you one more time, yet again. And we may have to do it often, Lord, mm -hmm. but we know that we have peace with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we will never be rejected. Thank you. And everything will work together for our good. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen.